Do the Mavericks have your attention now? Because if they somehow still didn't before, they damn sure should now. The Dallas Mavericks make it seven in a row, beating the Phoenix Suns last night, 123 to 113 in Dallas. In addition to this streak, which is the best streak going in the NBA right now, the Mavericks got 70 points out of Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Putting on a show, Luka got to be elevating himself in that MVP consideration now. I know some people still want to talk about Luka and say like, oh, well, the Mavericks aren't a very good team, so he shouldn't get consideration, while ignoring the fact that Jokic got it uh, previously when they were a really low seed. It happens. It does. It's more rare. It's certainly more difficult, but they're also going to try and pretend like the Mavericks haven't been the most injured team through the first part of the season. Uh, this was a thing posted out from the other day. This is from Dr. Matt Nine on Twitter. Total missed games by each starter on an MVP candidate's team. Jokic has seen 14 games from Murray, KCP with four, M MPJ with one, Gordon with six, for a total of 25. Shea Gilgis Alexander has seen six from J Dub, one from Giddy, no games from Chet. Two from Dort for a total of nine. So OKC has been damn healthy. Giannis, five games from Dane. Two from Beasley. Twelve from Middleton. Three from Brook. And uh, that gives you 22. Let's look at Luka. How many games have Luka's fellow starters missed? 22 games from Kyrie Irving. 22 games from Exum. Uh, Derek Jones Jr., five games and Derek Lively, 18 games. That's 67 total games. So you want to tell me that it's the team's record that we should be putting all of the stock in and not the individual's thing. Look what Luka is having to carry in terms of load. That's a separate conversation, but last night Luka goes for 41 big points in a dominant performance. Six made threes, 11 assists, four steals, his defensive presence has really stepped it up. The last five games, I think he's averaging two steals per game. The dude is putting in the work, and this team is thriving right now. Now, coming into this game, again, this was when it was still on a six-game winning streak. Dallas was rated as the number one defense, number six offense, and number one in net rating. This team, since the trade, trades, has been balling out. And that does not does not diminish in any sort of way what Luca has done all year, but it's putting it into that context now, where as we enter this stretch run of the season, the final, at this point, what, 26 games, I want to say that there is left, this has to be a consideration. If Luca keeps balling out like he is and the team is able to climb up because the West is so condensed and compact in terms of records, I could certainly see Luca climbing, or the, the Mavericks climbing up into that top four conversation. After this win last night, they moved up to number six, and I think it's barely any separation between them and the next two teams. So they're right there. They can absolutely move up the charts and get into that top four category. Yeah, here it is here. So the Mavericks are sitting at six. The Pelicans are one game ahead of them, and Denver is just a couple games. Denver's four games up on Dallas, so they can catch the Pelicans pretty quick, I want to say. And uh, Denver might take a little bit of extra work, but it's absolutely doable, especially when you look at who they're beating in this streak. Yeah, I know San Antonio is not good. That was the game previous right before the All-Star break. San Antonio is only 11 and 45, but they've knocked off Oklahoma City, who's currently second in the West. The 76ers in Philadelphia, the Nets in Brooklyn, New York in New York, the Thunder at home, the Wizards at home, the Spurs at home, and now the Suns at home. Phoenix is the seven seed, yes, but they are still a very talented team, and they are fighting and scrapping every bit as much as the Mavericks. They currently have the same record, but the Mavericks won the season series, I believe, with that win last night, so they have that tiebreaker there. So yes, it is very, very impressive what this team is doing, and you cannot take any anything away right now from P.J. Washington. I think since he came over to the Mavericks, the his defense has been so stellar. Like his fit in Dallas is phenomenal. Even in the game against San Antonio, 
his numbers were very ho hum, like very ho hum. But he, in the second half particularly, he took point on guarding Wimby. Wimby in the first half of that game, right before the All Star break, had 20 points, seven of 12 from the field. At halftime, Kid made the adjustment to put PJ Washington on as the main defender. And in the second half, Wimby ended up with six points on three of nine shooting. And because of that, even though Washington did not have a good offensive game, his net rating, his plus minus was still phenomenally strong. And to this point now with Dallas, I think he's still a plus 11 overall. He is a benefit to this team. What he is bringing in the way of athleticism, defensive versatility, defensive prowess in general is fantastic. Now, I know now that you've kind of brought Lively back into the fold, he's played now his second game back since uh, the nasal fracture that required surgery. I know Gafford has dropped off just a little bit because he's balancing that usage a little bit more with Lively. It's a two-headed monster. But even still, he's added so much to this team. The depth of this team is fantastic. Fantastic. It's probably the deepest team the Mavericks have had since the title. Like we've had times where they've been very talented, but top heavy. This is, this is a very deep, well-rounded team because their biggest deficiencies were, were rebounding, were paint protection, and really in general, just having that depth at the, the small forward there. So bringing, a, bringing in a guy who fits better uh, in the case of Washington and you know, it didn't work out with Grant. And Grant seems to be thriving, to his credit, in Charlotte. Good. Good for him. That means it's a balanced trade that fits both guys better because Washington is playing up to a higher level and he is vital in the athleticism he brings to this team. That's one of those things this team really needed. He's bigger. He's longer. He's more athletic. That is what this team needed. And what he's brought and how it's helped impact this team, the energy, the vibe of this team, feels different uh in his first three games with dallas this is from kevin gray uh jr on twitter his first three games with dallas the mavericks were a plus 51 on the defensive rating or sorry a plus 51 with a defensive rating of 88.7 overall net rating of 28.5 so yeah an immediate immediate presence this guy's uh what he brings to the team and kevin durant was even talking about it before the game last night basically saying like Look, they're already really talented with Luka and Kyrie, obviously, but the additions they made of Gafford and P.J. Washington, like, they're able just to be athletic and, you know, disruptive, and all they got to do is just knock down some spoon-fed shots Luka's going to set up for them, which that's what he does. That's what he does. And that is exactly the presence that we have seen. P.J. Washington in this game ends up with 12 points, six boards, and an assist, taking point on Kevin Durant, drawing a very tough assignment here, and is still able to really make Durant work. KD ends with 23 points on 9 of 22 shooting. When you got to shoot as many shots, basically, to get your points, 23 points on 23 shots, yeah, you're doing good. Two of eight from three, phenomenal stuff from Washington there. But the Mavericks in general, it, it's not just an aberration. It's not just one guy. Like they are so, so balanced and so deep of a roster at this point. And the the picture ahead looks very favorable as well. Dalton Trigg points out the Mavericks play nine straight against the East until March 13th when they play the Warriors. The Mavericks this season are 12 and five against the East. And uh, yeah, very, very promising there. When you look ahead to the immediate future, you got the feeling that, okay, given the trend, given the track record, this could be a very strong stretch for the Mavericks here. And, you know, seven games, obviously, is their longest streak of the season. It's the, the hottest team in the NBA right now. Jason Kidd, who has rightly so got, garnered a lot of criticism at times. He's looking at it too. Even, you know, even guys right now who have, had good stretches for this team. Jaden Hardy, for instance, uh, was very solid for this team right before the All-Star break, but he struggled to find minutes and opportunities in this game. And when kind of asked about that, like, hey, how do you how do you talk to a young player who it has been a big part of kind of contributing, has been on a positive uptick, and now looks like it's kind of dialing back just a little bit? Kids like, look, 
this is a deep team. This is probably the deepest the Mavericks have been in a long time. So our health, our energy, everything, like you just tell the kid, like, look, your time's going to come, but right now it's, it's going to be tough to kind of find that opportunity. And hopefully Hardy can respond the right way. That's got to be a really tough thing for a young player, but I really, really like what I'm seeing from the depth and the energy of this team. Here's the, uh, the tweet from Chuck Cooperstein. I way undersold that when I said plus 11 was his net rating. That was for the game against Phoenix. Correct plus rating for his overall stretch with the Mavericks here. In four games now, P.J. Washington is a plus 62 with the Mavericks. A plus 62 net rating. Plus 11 against Phoenix despite going against Kevin Durant. Fantastic. And, you know, P.J. Washington even said, um, he even said, like, I don't, I don't know that I've ever had this long of a winning streak in my career. Keep in mind, yes, the team is on seven. He's only personally on four. Four game win streak, he's saying, might be the longest of his career. Uh, his quote is, I was just telling someone in the locker room, this is the longest win streak I've ever had in my career. So I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. Everything you want to hear, like local kid coming back to the team, making a huge impact, completely changing the trajectory of where this team looks like it's headed. Granted, health has a lot to do with that as well. And he's just happy to be here. He's just vibing with this team and uh, feeling it. So there is a lot to like about the current trend and where this team is headed. This team does look different. This team does look vastly transformed. And they look like a team that is not just a dark horse necessarily, but they look dangerous. I'm not going to say that they're you know, put them in at the top of the Western Conference or anything like that. But I'm going to say, nobody's going to want to draw this number. No one's going to want to deal with the Mavericks here come playoffs. Why? Because you have two bona fide superstars who, if healthy, will tick, tick you apart themselves. They don't need a lot of help. But then you have this kind of defense and depth around them, and it's only going to make them that much more dangerous. Also, once again, shout out to Nico Harrison here. Looking at this, this is from Mike Sanders on Twitter. When you look at what Dallas gave up to acquire Kyrie Irving, P.J. Washington, and Daniel Gafford, it's two first-round picks, one first-round pick swap, two second-round picks, Dorian Finney-Smith, Spencer Dinwiddie, Grant Williams, Seth Curry, and Rashawn Holmes. That's like, I know that sounds like I'm rattling off a lot of assets here, but Dodo has not been the same since leaving Dallas. And his last year in Dallas was frankly a, a fairly noticeable drop off from where he was the two years prior. Spencer Dinwiddie is a nice player. I would have liked to have welcomed him back had he chosen to re-sign with Dallas where he, by his own admission, spent the best portion of his career where he was most successful and where he felt most embraced by the culture. But he wanted to go play for his hometown team, go play with the Lakers and play with LeBron, whatever, I understand. Um, I would have welcomed him back. But again, him being the centerpiece and getting Kyrie Irving, especially when you were able to re-sign Kyrie Irving, you do that every time. No question. Every time. Every single time. Grant Williams wasn't working out here. Seth Curry had nothing left in the tank as it related to contributing to this team in the present. They signed him three times in free agency. They traded him three times. Rashawn Holmes, I felt he should have been given a better shake here, a better opportunity, but you know what? He wasn't, so it wasn't going to work. And there's no point hanging on to something that's not going to work just because you say, yeah, but it should. It doesn't matter. It is or it isn't. You can't force it no matter how hard you try. We cannot force Rashawn Holmes to get minutes and opportunities and then for it to actually pay off on the floor. So you give up all of that, two first round picks and a first round pick swap, a couple second rounders and pieces that weren't working or just didn't have the same value as what you were bringing in. You got... Two starters and a guy capable of starting. A guy not only capable of starting, but at very comparable level to your new kind of cornerstone piece in Derek Lively. And you've really got something here. That is A plus, A plus plus effort and value for Nico Harrison. So as much as you have like your bleacher report to like grade the PJ Washington trade in particular, like, oh, that's a D plus for the Mavericks. That's not going to do a whole lot. Man, you are missing, you're missing the forest for the trees. You don't see it because this team, the impact, the value, the fit, 
all of that. It goes beyond simply looking at, well, this is the type of player he is, and this is what his stats show, but the guy that they were trading out shows these stats, so it's only a small gain. No, no, no. It's all so many factors, whether they're tangible or intangible, that have to be taken into consideration. It's not a perfect science. A lot of times it takes, there's a reason why you have this many guys who are, who assess teams and rosters and the professional level, regardless of the sport, by the way, who will struggle at times to find the right fit to make the pieces work and gel and create something better to help a team ascend to a next level or a next tier. It's incredibly difficult to do. There's a reason so few are like, really really good at it sometimes teams stumble into success that's just kind of how it works uh even the championship mavericks team when they made the move for tyson chandler when they traded uh the amnesty contract of eric dampier it wasn't an amnesty contract what was it i forget the condition of the thing but when they basically moved the eric dampier trade chip that was that, that was like yeah that's a nice move but they didn't know that it was going to take them to the level that it did. The year before that, when they made the trade with the Wizards uh, for Karan Butler, Deshaun Stevenson, and Brendan Haywood, they didn't know that that was going to have the impact that it had. They thought, like, yeah, this makes our team better. And, you know, Josh Howard kind of run his course here. He's kind of on a downward slope. His stock is dropping. He was, value-wise, never the same again. But you look at those things, and you say, like, yeah, this makes us a little better. But you wouldn't have thought like, yeah, this Washington trade is going to put you over the top. And by the way, not not at his own fault, but Karan Butler's not even going to be a huge part of that. Karan Butler, you know, obviously in the championship year, injures his knee, and it's Stevenson playing huge in the postseason, in the finals especially. And it's Haywood being a solid backup, really a starter quality center for that team, giving you a similar two-headed monster like you have now at the center position. All of that paid in, paid dividends, and made for a, a perfect storm for this team. So those are the kind of things you have to look at. Those are the kind of things that you have to consider here when you look at what a team's, what a team's uh, fit and ceiling is with one player versus another. And it's so incredibly difficult to quantify to explain but if you can do it if you can find that recipe you can take your team to a new height i'm not saying necessarily that this team is you know back to even to the western conference finals the west is brutal but i feel really good about where this team is at and where it feels like they're headed right now and again luka Doncic on an absolute mvp tear at this point, and I'm not calling the shot because I've seen others doing it already, so it would be disingenuous of me to do so. Um, but I'm I'm really starting to see the vision that's being laid out of like this team with the new talent, with them addressing the vast needs they have, health permitting. Luca is going to charge in and make that. I think this is going to be the breakthrough year for Luka in the MVP. And it's going to be a late season push because I think the Mavericks as a team are going to move up into that top four uh, category here in the West. I think they can catch the Nuggets or maybe it's that they're catching the Clippers, um, but they're going to catch somebody and move into that position where they got a top four record. They got a guy doing unbelievable things that have never been done before. This is from uh, right. This is during the all-star break. I saw this tweet come out from NBA on ESPN. Luka Doncic is scoring or assisting on 57.8 points per game this season, which is on pace for the most in a single season in NBA history. It has never been done before. When you look at his impact and the fact that even though the national media still is blind to the fact that he has improved his effort and his overall defensive prowess, it, it's it's going to change that narrative. And moments like last night saw his betting odds go from plus 700 to plus 600. The, the narrative is starting to shift. That was a prime time spotlight game. And he made a statement. Again, 41 points, delivering the dagger, showing out, doing MVP shit for a team that is the hottest team in the league and is really in position to make a lot of noise and catch a lot of people's attention. They've been slept on all season, somewhat understandably so, but they are going to get 
through if they keep this up. They are going to get through and make people notice. That's the whole idea. You have to be so good they can't ignore you. They can't dismiss you. Luca drops 70 points in a game, and they want to talk about, like, oh, what is the state of the defenses in the NBA these days? Man, miss me with that noise. Miss me with that noise. The fact is they want to diminish or take away from any accomplishment he makes, but eventually you keep stacking up those those resume pieces, those portfolio pieces for you. You keep throwing evidence in their face, and eventually they're going to have to acknowledge you. They're going to have to treat you like Roman Reigns, acknowledge the tribal chief here. You can't dismiss what is right in front of your face and what is basically grabbing you by the collar and saying, look at this mother effer. And that's exactly what Luka Doncic and the Mavericks feel like they're starting to do here. And considering all the body of work Luka's already laid out across the season until now, now that the team success might be following, it's going to happen. That's my feeling. That is my gut feeling right now that this is going to happen. Here's another cool stat I had here. Again, this is from before the game. Landon Thomas uh, talking about P.J. Washington, his impact on the floor. Offensive rating on the floor, again, before the game last night, 116.67. Defensive rating, 90. That's a net rating of 26.67. When he's off the floor, the offensive rating is 121.19. <gasps> it's better, but the defensive rating is 110.34. That's, that's only 10.84 points better. So his impact, vastly better, even if they're not scoring as many points. We haven't even seen a huge offensive game from him necessarily yet. What we're seeing is the impact on the defensive side, which I would argue is actually better. That's what the team more so needs. So having that is everything. Having that impact is huge. I love this idea that Dallas is finally gelling and finding their rhythm here and that they are moving into a position where they cannot be denied because they've been slept on since really since it feels like Jalen Brunson left and part of that's understandable part of that just boils down to health but we're getting to a point where they can't be ignored any longer and statements like last night are going to go a long way to changing that narrative but what do you think let me know in the comments is this the best win of the season for the Mavericks not necessarily the most impressive but maybe the biggest statement issued is there more that the Mavericks need to show you before you're fully bought into this team being a deep threat long run? Let me know in the comments. Leave a comment. Subscribe. Till next time, guys. Remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.